Hello, I'm Michelle Holder. As you may have heard earlier during my opening remarks, which was yesterday, no, actually it was today. <laughs> I'm the president and CEO here at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. In this panel, envisioning a new economic future, what's next? I'll be moderating a conversation on how to leverage deficits to invest in a green future and build broadly shared and sustainable economic growth while ensuring people of color in the US can fully benefit from any such investments. Our discussion will focus on two pillars of building a new economic future, racial equity and transitioning to a climate conscious economy. I'm especially excited to talk about how these two pillars interact. Before we get to what is bound to be a stimulating discussion, I wanna first take a moment to introduce our esteemed panel. First, we have Olivier Blanchard, who is Robert Solo Professor Emeritus, Emeritus at MIT and Fred, Fred Bergsten Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. He is a macroeconomist who has worked on a wide range of issues, including the role of monetary and fiscal policy, the nature of speculative speculative bu bubbles, and the nature of the labor market and the determinants of unemployment. Next, we have Denia Francis, an assistant professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Her research interests include examining racial and socioeconomic disparities in education, wealth accumulation, and labor markets. Her current research involves using ex experimental and quasi-experimental methods to identify structural causes of racial and socioeconomic academic achievement gaps. Finally, we have Brenda Mallory, Chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality. As Chair, she advises the President on environmental and natural resource policies that improve, preserve, and protect public health and the environment for America's communities. She was previously the Director of Regulatory Policy at the Southern Environmental Law Center and the Executive Director and Senior Counsel for the Cons Conservation Litigation Project. I'm now going to proceed to ask questions of my panelists. And panelists, please, please feel free for this first round of questioning to take up to five minutes for your answer. My first question goes to Olivier. Olivier, you recently wrote on major future economic challenges, including climate change and economic inequality. What were the major findings of the report and what do you see as the implications for the economic situation in the United States? Well, first, thank you, Michelle, for inviting me. I'm a bit of an outsider being from the other side of the Atlantic, but I'll do my best. Uh, I'm going to give a, big, a bit of background, which will explain why probably you invited me, which is I was asked by the French president to think about future challenges and the policies that we need to take in order to meet them. And so I created a commission uh, with my uh, friend, uh, Jean Tirole, who is a French Nobel Prize in economics. And we decided to make it a very international commission, 24 members from the US, from Europe, from everywhere. And uh, we decided to work on three themes. We decided to work on global warming or climate change in general. Uh, this will be familiar to Brenda, uh, on inequality and on aging. And uh, we worked on each of these themes. I think what I want to say is two things uh, in terms of background. The first thing, this would be a tremendously useful commission to have in the US for the same reasons. And the second is that I, we chose a very wide set of opinions to start. And what I was trying, you know, it went from Paul Krugman to Laura Tyson to Nick Stern to Larry Summers. I mean, with you know, some people more or less from the right, some people more or less from, and there was enormous consensus. And I think that's really important that you get 24, you know, good economists in a room and they agree on a number of things. So it's what I'm going to try to, to communicate. I think that, you know, there's much more agreement as to what should be done. And then the politics come as it comes in, obviously. So let me just mention the conclusions on, on, on two issues. I'm going to leave uh, aging aside. Um, the first one is on global warming. So there, you know, I think there's a consensus among uh, economists and others, which is you need to do all kinds of things. You need to subsidize research. You need to ban some things you need. But in the end, something that you absolutely need to have is a price of carbon. And the reason for this is that without a price of carbon, some measures are very inefficient. They cost a fortune 
for each ton of CO2 you're able to remove. And if you let people decide or governments decide without you know, yardstick, it's, it, it costs much more than it should. Uh, now, the reason it, you know, I, I mentioned this in this context is that I mean, we, this is not about global warming, but if you put a carbon price in, uh, it's very regressive. Uh, basically, you know, the poor people uh, use much more energy as a proportion of their budget. And so you have to do something. And so what we worked on in the report is, okay, so what are the compensation schemes that you need in order to protect some of the people and therefore get support? Now, the reason I mentioned this is that I think we should spend as much time on the compensation schemes as on the technical issues. Uh, because otherwise it's not going to happen. And when I see, with all the respect to Brenda, when I see the Biden administration not mention the carbon price because they're probably worried about the politics, I think it's a mistake. I think we have to sell it because it's needed. And we have to really be serious about distributional issues. So one point on global warming, we can come back to it. Then on inequality, so the, you know, the report was aimed at France. And France is a very different country from the US, as we learned in the last few days. Uh, but in particular, with respect to inequality, uh, France basically has much less inequality both before transfers and after transfers than the US. Uh, and it, things haven't gotten, gotten much worse as opposed to the US where inequality just exploded. So the issue is a bit different, but when we, we did a survey, uh, we did a number of surveys actually, and, and people you know, feel inequality is a very big issue, even in France. And the reason for this is that what they feel is that they don't have access to good jobs. They they are just not enough good jobs, they get bad jobs. They don't have access to career paths. Uh, there is an enormous amount of uh, intergenerational transmission of inequality, you know, rich, rich people have rich kids and so on. And so we decided to work on this. And, you know, what do you do about inequality? Well, you can work at free margins. You can work before production, trying to equalize chances, which is very important. You can work after production, repairing, you know, giving, redistributing, which is the standard way. And then you can work in the production process itself, trying to change it. And so the points I'm going to make, if I have a two or three minutes left, is on equalizing chances, education, 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 and professional training uh, all the way. And you know, even in France, which is doing better than the US, uh, enormous inequality. But the good news is that we found a number of ways in which we can actually decrease the inequality. Long way to go, smaller classrooms, I mean, we can discuss what needs to be done, but it's, it costs money, but it can be done. The other where we uh, got you know, a, a mixed uh, reception is uh, inheritance taxes, because if you look, you know, much of the inequality is transferred through uh, inheritances. And there we said, and it was again, you know, a commission composed of people who are not considered Marxists. Uh, there was large support for something like this. It's needed. And then the last point I'll make, which was a point which I think is very exciting. We don't have, you know, we don't know exactly how to implement it, is doing production. Because if you look in France, for example, uh, you know, there's much less inequality before the transfers. Firms are organized differently. Uh, the distribution of income, pre-tax is different. And so this tells us, don't take this as a given. You know, the, it's not technology which determines inequality. It's technology and the organization of firms and the type of R&D. Can you subsidize R&D so that, you know, you create, it helps basically complements people rather than substitutes for them. Uh, can you reorganize firms so as to give them incentives to keep people, train people? Uh, you put this with professional training. And we think that you know, this is absolutely first order. Now, again, all this is in a French context, but you know, I have no doubt that to a large extent that's relevant everywhere. So you know, the report was 600 pages, so I'm not going to cover all of it. I'm just going to stop here, but we can come back to whatever you want, Michelle. Thank you so much, Olivier. And uh, uh, interesting note, uh, Professor Blanchard, I explained to him uh, that he taught me macro 
and he asked me, how did I teach you macro? I said, well, it's actually your textbook, macroeconomics. It was really similar at um, the new school who, cool. your book. <laughs> so that was an interesting conversation. Uh, Professor Blanchard and I had. Um, so I uh, want to now turn to Dania and pose a question to her. Uh, Dania, I wonder if you think that's a, if you think that a fair assessment uh, that Olivier just provided. And if you can speak to how the problems of environmental and racial justice might feed off one another or magnify each other. Absolutely, thank you. First, let me, let me thank uh, you and the Washington Center for Equitable Growth for inviting me to this important discussion. Um, so, I, you know, my uh, area of expertise um, really brings me um, to this conversation, uh, maybe from a slightly different perspective um, uh, than Professor Blanchard. And so how I tend to think about racial justice and environmental justice is really to, to, to break it into, I think first understanding what has happened in the past um, that has direct and indirect consequences for the present circumstances. And then second, taking lessons from the past to create strategies that effectively address climate change in a racially equitable way. So, so in that sense, I think, you know, what resonates with me from what um, Professor Blanchard was saying was, you know, avoiding you know, regressive solutions, right, making sure to um, take into account uh, the fact that there's intergenerational wealth um, and, and the like. Um, but so, so, so first I'll talk about, you know, what has happened in the past, right? Um, so Elizabeth Yampierre, who's a co-chair of the, the Climate Justice Alliance, has been quoted as saying, quote, climate change is the result of a legacy of extraction, of colonialism, of slavery, unquote. Right, this is a legacy that involved the confiscation and division of land for extractive purposes at the expense of black and indigenous communities that went on for centuries. Right, extractive government policies contribute directly to the struggles in indigenous communities for food and water security today. So to separate racial justice and climate justice, I think is impossible. And so how has this manifest both structurally and more recently in the United States? The US government's practice of redlining in the 1930s excluded investment in black communities, shifted resources to white communities, and when coupled with racism in housing markets, relegated black families to the worst neighborhoods in cities across the US. Then the government sanctioned urban renewal projects of the 1950s and 1960s raised many black neighborhoods, including strong black middle class enclaves to the ground, destroying a sense of community and further depleting black property ownership. And so these actions have real consequences for environmental um, uh, equity today. Right, the neighborhoods where black households live contribute to higher incidences of asthma and upper respiratory disease. The age of the housing stock increases the likelihood that children are exposed to lead contaminants that can negatively impact their cognitive development. Right, and that has ripple effects for education inequalities as well. Uh, in a study published in, in Nature uh, in March of this year, they showed that neighborhoods that were graded D on redlining maps, which were mostly black and ethnic minority neighborhoods, have 23% tree canopy coverage today on average, while neighborhoods graded A have 43% coverage, right? Ne nearly twice as much. And so tree canopy coverage is important because it protects against the effects of heat islands, right? Which is becoming increasingly important as climate change increases the incidences of heat waves and droughts. Right? Researchers at Tufts have been uh, studying the health impacts of the smallest particulate pollution, which is 0.1 microns or smaller, which to my knowledge are not regulated by the EPA when they're that small. And so these particulates are small enough to go directly into the bloodstream and cause inflammation leading to cardiovascular disease. Where are these small particulates most present? Closest to highways, right? And these are the same highways that were cut directly through black neighborhoods. Right, so there's a history here that's directly linked to racial climate inequalities, health inequalities, and ripple effects for education inequalities. And so any climate solutions going forward needs to put positive weight on addressing these inequalities from the past uh, that resonate into the, the present. And at the very least, they need to be solutions that do not continue to do further damage to these communities. And I'll stop there. I'm happy to talk more about um, what it means for 
in particular for climate solutions that, that can focus on um, a racial justice lens. Thank you, Dania. And now I'd like to turn to Brenda. Uh, Brenda, my question for you is, first, environmental and racial justice can sometimes be two sides of the same coin, such as when highway widening both displace communities of color while also worsening environmental and climate outcomes. Can you talk about how you see these issues coming together in the Build Back Better plan? And also, how does the Biden administration think about this? Great, well, first of all, thank you, Michelle. I really appreciate uh, being invited to participate in this uh, discussion. The program itself looks terrific. And obviously just from the introductions from my fellow panelists, I think um, I'm, I feel honored to be here. So thank you for that. Um, I think at core, um, we think about environmental justice is, as being about protecting people's basic right to drink clean water, breathe clean air, and to live into healthy communities. And so, you know, while this is a value that I think we think is important, uh, it's not one that we is the shared reality of everyone. I think the um, the opening conversation actually has just pointed to the ways in which that has not proven true across the board, uh, and we recognize that. Um, so we have, you know, like significant. Uh, you know, we know that people, where people live has a significant impact on their overall health. Um, and using a, a zip code, just as an example, it tells us a lot about a community's environment, about the historic inequities, about disinvestment, and the concentration of polluting facilities that plague that area come through when you just look at um, uh, zip codes across the country. So I wanna talk just briefly about um, a recent example I experienced. I went to um, zip code 48217, which is Michigan's most polluted zip code. Uh, and I wasn't there long, but it didn't take much time to kind of see and feel the harms of pollution and its impact on, uh, on the community. It was very hazy. Um, there was a distinct smell because of the pollutants in the air. And as I talked to people, I heard about the impacts that people were suffering, just as Dania was saying, you know, disproportionately high rates of asthma and cancer and brain damage and heart disease, you know, respiratory problems, among other things. Um, and I also heard in this particular community about how the polluting facilities took over a thriving working class neighborhood, uh, like the example that Dania was just uh, pointing to, there was a highway involved there as well, but I think that the um, that's the, the uh, arrival of some of the um, polluting facilities even came before that. So, I mean, these are the kinds of problems that are exacerbated by climate change um, because already the community is experiencing stress, the people are experiencing stress from a variety of sources, and then climate change is, uh, you know, an overlay uh, on all of that. Um, clearly climate change poses an existential threat to our lives and our livelihoods. Uh, and the impacts of this crisis are felt more acutely in black, brown, indigenous and low income uh, communities. And so as the president has started saying, you know, this is code red, this is a code red situation that we're dealing with. And I think it's in, in kind of incumbent upon us as we're sort of pushing forward with various policy approaches to you know, have that sort of front and center. Um, President Biden believes that we must invest in our country, in our low income communities, in the communities of color by creating good jobs, improving public health and resources and sustaining kind of equitable economic growth for decades to come. So looking at some of the problems that um, Dania outlined uh, at sort of front and center to the way that the Biden administration has been thinking about you know, what, what's needed. Um, looking at the Build Back, um, sorry, the bipartisan infrastructure deal, um, uh, it includes investments uh, that will take critical steps in advancing equity and racial justice throughout our economy, making more, you know, making our economy more fair and equitable and just. And just a few quick examples, it, it, it creates um, the first ever program to reconnect communities divided by transportation 
infrastructure, helping to provide affordable transportation options to communities where historic infrastructure investments have divided communities like Clairborn Expressway in New Orleans or I-81 in Syracuse. Uh, and it delivers thousands of electric school buses nationwide, uh, including in rural communities, um, you know, while helping school districts to buy clean American made zero emissions buses um, that will uh, ensure that the pollution that the children are otherwise experiencing and that is disproportionately affects kids of color is, is reduced. But we know that the uh, infrastructure bill by itself is not enough. And that's why the president is continuing to kind of push for the Build Back Better agenda, which cuts taxes for working families, makes significant investments in our caregiving infrastructure, and keep, increases educational opportunities, expands access to health care, increases the housing supply, spurs regional uh, development, uh, grows workforce development programs, uh, and provides critical nutrition and assistance. So these are all things that I think we, we believe are uh, essential to helping to you know, revitalize the, the people and the economy around it. Um, so uh, I'll stop there. Uh, I think I've, <laughs> I've said enough, appreciate you. Thank you so much, Brenda. And uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to stick with you for another question. Uh, but before I ask that, I just want to point out uh, to the attendees, uh, please feel free to start uh, submitting questions in the chat box um, for the panelists. So sticking uh, with you uh, right now, Brenda, I did want to ask you a kind of follow-up question. Um, what are some of the historical wrongs that you see as the most important from an environmental justice lens in this country? And what sort of actions uh, is the Biden administration taking uh, to try to rectify uh, these historical wrongs? Yeah, um, so I'll just go back to kind of where I started at the top, you know, with a sort of recognition of this belief that environmental justice is guided by, you know, a belief that there is a fundamental right to drink clean water, to breathe clean air, and to live in a healthy community. And so we're trying to like, uh, think about our sort of policy from that perspective. I think the bottom line is, is we as a country have failed to deliver those basic protections to everyone. Uh, the remnants of housing segregation, redlining, and other discrimination, underinvestment, unequal application of protections and programs and a failure to listen to communities have all resulted in you know, the current inequality that we see across the country. Um, and you know, correcting these wrongs will require a long-term commitment. Um, and I think we are at the place now where we're acknowledging that need for change and creating a plan of action uh, to move forward, which is a critical first step, but it's a first step. Um, so this administration has been committed to incorporating equity for historically overburdened and underserved communities throughout um, the administration's policy initiatives. Um, and the way in which we like hope to both uh, push for ambition among ourselves, but also to kind of keep track of like how the agencies are um, responding to that are kind of through two tools that the, the president created uh, at, the, at the beginning of the administration. Um, the first was the first ever White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, which is a council made up of 26 longtime environmental justice advocates and experts from across the country. Um, and the second was a, uh, again, first time ever White House Environmental Justice Interagency Council, which is composed of senior leaders from all of the key agencies. Uh, and this is, a, this is a body that I, I chair um, and both are kind of, from our perspective, will enable, um, you know, really looking at the issues through a kind of a whole of government approach uh, and, and ensuring that we are hearing from and, you know, um, receiving the sort of the thoughts from, from folks who have really been living and, the, and thinking about environmental justice issues in a very a clear way. So just from the perspective of the federal agencies, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, we're asking federal agencies to evaluate the, excessive, excuse me, the accessibility and impact of their programs 
on low income communities and communities of color and and to ensure that all communities are receiving the intended benefits that are um, established by those um, by those programs. Um, and then equally important, President Biden set a historic goal to deliver 40% of the overall benefits from relevant federal investments in clean energy and infrastructure to historically disadvantaged communities. Um, we call this justice, justice 40. And our environmental justice goals go hand in hand with our economic and clean energy goals because we know that environmental justice communities are hit first and hardest by climate change events. Uh, so in order to really address climate change, we have to address the impacts on vulnerable communities. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Brenda. And now I wanna pivot slightly to sort of zero in on uh, racial inequality. And so I'd like to uh, ask my next question to Olivier. Um, because there is some relationship, certainly in uh, the instance of the United States and uh, wealth inequality. So Olivier, in your report uh, that you talked about um, earlier, uh, there is the issue of addressing inequality in inheritances. Um, why is mitigating these unequal inheritances crucial for building a more inclusive economy? Good. The first reaction is that you no know, countries are different. Uh, so racial issues don't have the same intensity uh, in, in, in France than in, they have in the US. But I realized listening to both Brenda and Dania that we focused on inequality very much in the professional part of life. Uh, you know, good jobs, access to good jobs, training. Well, I think what Dania and Brenda have shown which is probably more important for the US, but not irrelevant for France, is that inequality has many more dimensions. Uh, you know, good water, uh, no lead, all these things. And I, I realize, I think, listening to you, that we should have touched on these things, uh, but somehow, you know, we, we didn't. But I, I think that that's the first point. Inequality is really a much wider concept than just income. At least we went from income to jobs, which is you know, good jobs, which is already progress, but it's more than that. On your, on your question, I mean, if you look at the numbers, you know, why is it that inequality continues? Uh, it's basically because people get very different education. So we know that, but it's also because they start life in very different conditions. Um, you know, some kids have no problem financing college or having their parents financing college and others don't have a penny and you know must start work and so on and so on uh, so if you're going to be serious about inequality being racial in the us but in general if inequality you have to basically transfer from the rich kids to the poor kids i mean i think that that just follows if you're serious about inequality you cannot avoid doing something at that margin now clearly people don't like the idea and at least people with rich kids uh, but it needs to be done. So what we argued, you know, the U.S. inheritance uh, taxation is a joke, right? I, you know, each of us can give 11 million to, if, if we only had it, uh, to our kids. Uh, it's just irrelevant. So what should be done? And let me just try something on you. But, you know, I, I think that's something that should be discussed in the U.S. is you, you should first focus not on who gives, but who receives. Right? And basically, this is what we care about. And we should not focus on what they get when their parents die, which is typically by now they are 60, right? It's much too late for them to do anything in life. Uh, you want to basically look at what they receive throughout life. So you basically want to focus on the beneficiaries and just look at what they receive over time and accumulate this. It happens in the US, except you don't pay taxes on that. But the other thing that we found is that people have a genuine desire to give some of what they earned to their kids. And that's, I think that's a human trait. So you have to have a threshold, which is sufficiently high that people have worked all their life and have, you know, a small house or something like this. But once you've done this, I think the way to think about inheritance taxes is different from tax the rich. Uh, it is a transfer for a social contract from rich kids to poor kids. So one way of thinking about this is uh, 
you know, if you're going to give $100 to your kids, then if you're above the threshold, you have to give $10, $20 to a fund, which goes to kids, you know, with low income to start or whatever. So it seems to me that it has to be sold that way. But without that tool, which nobody talks about, uh, it's going to be very hard. Uh, you know, you can do a lot on education, but it's not going to go all the way. So again, this sounds very different from the discussions that, that we've had, but it's another idea which I think is, is worth thinking hard about. Thank you, Olivier. And so now I want to sort of stick with this topic in terms of my next question to Dania. Um, and, and the relevance here is really in terms of the racial wealth gap uh, in the United States. So Dania, uh, you've written before, including for equitable growth on reparations. Could you tell us how do you see reparations playing? What role do you, or, or what is the, I should say, uh, interaction or relationship between reparations and wealth inequality in the United States? That's great, thank you. Um, so, so I think that um, you know the, the the major the major point I would make is that when we look at wealth inequality in the U.S. in particular racial wealth inequality, um, it, we can draw you know kind of a direct line back to some of these discriminatory policies that um, that we mentioned earlier, right? Redlining, uh, urban renewal, right? The 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 ability. Right, slavery, Jim Crow, right? Like the, the interruption of the ability um, of, of black families, um, indigenous families, right? To be able to um, accumulate wealth at the same rate um, and with the same opportunities as white families in the past. Why does that matter? It matters because what we were just uh, talking about was that you know wealth is, is intergenerational. Right. If we don't have a strong um, uh, inheritance tax or a strong system of, of redistribution of this intergenerational wealth, then there's a leg up. Right. Um, and um, Olivia is right that it's not just through um, inheritance. It's throughout the life course. Right. It's the ability of my parents to help me pay for college so that when I finish college, I have less debt and I'm better able to um, finance a house in a nice neighborhood. A nice neighborhood matters because it matters for my health, right? For the environmental uh, consequences we were talking about earlier. And it matters because the nice neighborhoods have nice schools and that uh, affects my children, right? So in that way, there are all these ripple effects of access that wealth provides, right? So, 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 so the key point here that I'd make is that um, uh, wealth provides, provides access and a leg up that is sometimes uh, invisible. And when I say invisible, I mean sort of dangerously invisible in the sense that if I'm benefiting from intergenerational wealth, but it's not something that I ever talk about or think about or know, and the people in my community are also benefiting in the same way, so I don't see that there are people who aren't benefiting in that same way, right? Then I think that everything I've earned is because of my hard work. And if I look at communities that don't have it, it's because they don't work hard. Right. And so in that sense, I think that this sort of invisible transmission of intergenerational wealth um, uh, is dangerous for how we view inequality, how we view poverty. Right. Um, and so all that sort of, uh, you know, to bring it back around to this discussion of um, the question you asked me about about reparations is, you know, Education alone is not enough to um, overcome. Um, Olivier just, just said that in the context in France, and it's the case also um, in the US, these wealth gaps, it's not enough. When we look at um, even highly educated black households, they have um, a fraction of the wealth of similarly educated white households and even white households with, with lower levels of education, right? So, so, so education is important, um, but it's not enough. Um, and, and, and really then, you know, how do we address uh, the racial wealth gaps in the US through something like direct transfers, right? Um, and, 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 and what I'm calling uh, and what people call uh, reparations, right? And so in that sense, we're talking about reparations, not just for, for, for slavery, um, for Jim Crow in the South, but for a lot of the state sanctioned, government sanctioned policies in the past that led to um, the wealth gaps that we see today. Thank you so much, Dania. Um, 
at this point, uh, I would definitely like to, first of all, thank the panelists. We're not going anywhere. I just want to say thank you. Uh, I know that, you know, uh, most people think uh, conversations about racial justice and climate justice are normally quite distinct, but I think you all did a, a great job trying to show the links between the two. And so now I'd like to turn to questions from uh, the audience. I think we have two or three. Um, the first question uh, I'm going to pose to all of the panelists uh, and whomever uh, feels like they would like to take that one, please do. Um, but I think this is a question that is, is um, an important one. Uh, this one comes from Thomas. Uh, uh, he asks, what do the panelists think would be the most effective way to distribute the revenues from pricing carbon to alleviate overall and racial inequality? Anyone can answer. I can start because that's something that we thought hard about. I think first, uh, there should be an explicit allocation of the revenues from the carbon tax or the of the uh, carbon permits, the sale of carbon permits to the people who are likely to suffer from uh, the increase in energy prices, in the price of gas. It should be a commitment. I don't think that all of the money should go to, the, to those people, and I don't think all people should be compensated. People who made the wrong choices should not, you know, basically be bailed out. But I think it's essential for a scheme which has carbon price to explicitly give some of the revenues back to the people who are suffering from it. Now, this being said, that's not obvious. You know, who do you give it to? People who have long commutes or just poor people? Uh, it's, that's where there has to be a lot of work. But I think the commitment is essential. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, Brenda or Dania, would you care to weigh in on this question? Yeah, the only thing I would add is, um, you know, there's just like such tremendous sensitivity, certainly in the environmental justice community, when you talk about um, the notion of kind of paying people essentially for what folks feel like is the continuation of the harm, right? Like uh, continuing to allow uh, their communities to suffer and experience what is being caused um, by the carbon. And, um, and I hear that a lot, a lot, <laughs> just, just given the environmental justice work that is uh, centered in CEQ. So I just wanted to put that out there. I mean, I think part of the, part of the objection, at least from that side of the um, you know, spectrum of stakeholders is, is a sense that you know, if you allow people to pay for continuing to poison them, that, you know, continuing to have communities serve as sacrifice zones, that's an issue of concern. So I, I just want to share that because it is something that I, I hear a lot. Yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead. Did you want to say? I was just going to, to to add that I that I absolutely appreciate um, that perspective, Brenda, and that that that's why it's important to have um, broad representation of voices in um, any climate solutions talks, right? That um, that that hearing those perspectives from um, communities that um, may have less voice, less political power um, in the U.S., uh, um, you know having access to, 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 to wealth is often correlated with access to um, uh, political power. And so um, communities that have less of that also need this representation in, in these discussions. Thank you both, Brenda and Dania. Our next question is an interesting one. Uh, it comes from Aliyah. And Aliyah asks, during the shutdown, air quality improved. Well, that's a statement she made at the beginning. Here's the question. Do you think government should give incentives for people to stay and work from home as much as possible, minimize commuting, protect the environment and prevent spread the spread of pandemics in the future? So in essence, she's asking, should the government become involved in incentivizing us 
all to uh, continue to do a lot of our productive uh, stuff from home, which uh, according to Leah does help the environment. Anyone can answer that question. Yeah, I guess I would just say, you know, obviously that's bringing government into a, a role that <laughs> there would be huge concerns about. Um, I mean, even in places where we clearly have a role, there's a concern about our, uh, uh, you know, uh, intervening. Um, I think that's probably going uh, a bit too far, but I do think that what we have learned in the last, you know, 18 months to two years um, is causing lots of entities to think about just the way that they operate, how they're set up, the extent to which there will be more uh, at-home work than there had been, you know, allowed before. I think we will see some, you know, transformations as we, you know, get further on the other side of the, of the pandemic that uh, are likely to have some, um, you know, or may have some positive be benefits because there is sort of a reduction in um, commuting uh, in, to the work, in workplace every day. Okay, thank you, Brenda. Again, I, I, I'm happy to come, come in and add a little. I agree with Brenda. I think that that should be left to firms and people to a first approximation. It's clear that many more people want to stay home a bit, and this will decrease commuting, which is good. Uh, but I'm not sure the government should be should be directly involved in it. However, at the same time, uh, we have to ask, you know, are cities organized the right way with this very long commute? And there the government has to come in because, you know, if, if you don't have a government, then the city just builds itself randomly and so on. So I think we have to rethink uh, this organization in which basically poor people live, you know, on the outside and have long commute. Uh, to come inside. And uh, that's an issue everywhere in the world. And I think that uh, what has happened with COVID has made us realize how crazy this is. So I think that, you know, the, the whole issue of urbanism, how we basically build cities in the future, how do we change these, the ones which exist, is a big issue. And I think that COVID has forced us to, to think about. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, we have another question. Um, it's a it's a good one as well. Uh, what federal what well, what policies period might be needed to support workers as the U.S. transitions to a cleaner, greener economy, uh, particularly at the federal level, but it could be at either the state or local level. This is a question for anyone on the panel. Well, if Daniel and Brenda are waiting, I'll, I'll go first again. Uh, but this is an issue which actually uh, we discussed uh, last week in, in a meeting. And the evidence was so far that uh, some of the jobs which disappear are replaced by green jobs, which can be done by the people who have the skills uh, needed for brown jobs. So there's a sense in which for the moment, the jobs which are created can be used to basically allow people who are losing their jobs in the bond fields uh, to find other jobs. But in the future, it's not at all obvious that this will be the case. Uh, you know, if, if we're going to build electricity stations all over the US in order for electric cars to be actually useful, uh, that's marvelous in the sense that it creates jobs everywhere in the US. So it's very good. But maybe once we've done that, what we'll need is you know, to create some technologies which will be located in one or two places in the US. And then the issue is what happens to the people who lose their jobs in the coal mines or whatever. And I think that that's a very big issue because the amount of reallocation which is going to be needed is very large. And again, professional training, but you know, focused professional training here should be part, I'm sure it's in the 3.5 trillion somewhere, uh, but should be part of, of the infrastructure plan. That's absolutely first order is my view. Yeah, uh, let me just jump in there because I do feel like there's a lot of thought in particular uh, have, that has been uh, given to that transition from, from for coal communities and how you can sort of look at um, you know, look at what's available in some of those communities that could have a uh, role or a place in the transition. Like, so how do you 
how do you take the circumstances that exist either in those communities or related and uh, turn them into opportunities um, that you know, move us in the direction of the clean energy economy, but also help us clean up some of the remnants from uh, from some of the uh, you know the coal work. So, for example, the the idea of you know um, the you know wells that are uh, abandoned wells that exist in uh, various communities, and how you can you know we need to remove those for the health considerations and the impacts that it has, but use that as a way to uh, build um, opportunity, job opportunity for, for people in the community. And just different things like that, I think are you know, front and center on people's minds of you know, making this moment and the opportunity created by the desire to move to a clean energy economy also be uh, a way to, to make sure that the folks who have, are gonna bear the brunt in some ways of uh, the transition are also um, front and center in the planning. Thank you for that, Brenda. Uh, Denise, I just wanted to make sure you had an opportunity if you wanted to weigh in. Yes, sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I think that, I think um, I agree um, with what's been said so far. And I guess maybe just um, uh, another thing I would add would be um, a focus on um, racial equity in the awarding of, of contracts and subcontracts that um, uh, that come about from uh, investments in um, green technology, clean energy, and um, uh, in a way that has um, more impact and teeth, maybe is what I'm trying to say, than, than what's going on um, with our policies today. Um, I think there was a study in, in um, you know, Massachusetts that showed that even though we have, uh, where I'm located, even though we have um, incentives for sub subcontracting with minority-owned businesses and um, uh, women-owned businesses, that when you look at the dollars that are that are going in the direction of those um, firms, that it's a, a, a tiny fraction of the amount of the total um, uh, government contracting that's um, that's spent, and so so I think there's got to be more done with um, uh, one reporting and understanding where uh, some of excuse me some of these um, contract dollars are going, um, and and understanding that you know part of the reason why we have. Um, these uh, incentives for, for minority-owned businesses, um, uh, women-owned businesses, uh, is because these businesses um, uh, can are you know capable and do um, an excellent job, but may not have the connections with um, uh, especially subcontractors, right? With main contractors that are that are choosing, and so encouraging um, businesses to go out and, and seek these firms, I think, is important um, and definitely as we we expand. Uh, investment in, in in clean energy. Michelle, can I just add one thing to that? Because that's that was really um, a very, I think, a really poignant point. I mean, I, I think the other thing that we are seeing and spending a lot of time thinking about is that issue of uh, ensuring that the um, the resources that we're you know that we're some that we don't have yet, but that we have now even are like making it to the places where there's the where there's actually need and that is that is not necessarily a small task because again when you think about institutional structures that are in place that have um, facilitated having funding like not arrive at uh, you know all communities like you have to figure out how to take those apart uh, in order to create the opportunity so for example you know often there may be funding for example thinking about um, you know, result in the resilient space or you know post um, extreme weather event, where there's funding available, but it often goes to kind of more advanced you know advantaged communities because they know how to go through the process, they know how to um, do the applications, they know how um, to sort of set set themselves up in a way that they're more likely to receive them, and so you know you need technical assistance for people who don't know, but have the need, uh, you know, you need a way for people to be able to participate in the process. And that has to be part of the, you know, the economic plan as well. Um, so uh, thank you for that comment. It's part inspired that. Thank you so much. Um, I want to say once again, uh, my extreme appreciation to Brenda Mallory, Dania Francis and Olivier Blanchard for a fantastic uh, panel. 